the Electronic Entertainment Expo is the world's biggest gaming showcase, and it kicks off this week. But the industry is expanding beyond diehard gamers. Here's a look at who's playing games by the numbers. A survey by the Entertainment Software Association of Canada found that three in five Canadians played video games at least once in a four-week period. That's up by five percentage points from 2010. Children and teenagers played even more. 90% said they played video games over the same period. Nearly two-thirds of households own a video game console, too. And the gender gap between gamers continues to close. Now, 46% of gamers are female, up from 38% just two years ago. Mobile gaming is also hot. 80% of households own at least one cell phone, tablet, or other mobile device. Scott Steinberg is the CEO of Tech Savvy. He's in Los Angeles for the Electronic Entertainment Expo today. We spoke earlier, starting with what he thinks the headline of this year's show will be. Well, I think the big headline this year is going to be a lot entertainment focused. You're seeing manufacturers like Microsoft and Sony that are doubling down on digital entertainment, not strictly gaming. And of course, more sequels, big blockbuster franchises, popular titles like Gears of War, God of War, Halo. You're going to see more of what you know and love. And at the same time, of course, Nintendo's Wii U is going to be making major headlines. Everybody's going to be looking at the company to see whether or not it can regain the lofty heights it had and the success of the Wii. But there's a lot of question marks that surround the system, which is tablet based at the moment. Yes, I have a lot of questions about this system. What is it, Wii U? How can it be tablet-based <laughs> when I thought the whole idea of the Wii was that you got to move around and interact? I mean, a tablet, you're just poking the thing, aren't you? Well, there are some motion controls attached to it, but they're also looking at some traditional gaming controls as well, and they're adding on some futuristic features like near-field communication, so you actually will have wireless sensitivity there, and you'll actually be able to use the device as a remote control. It's interesting in that they're doubling down on split screens, and there are big questions surrounding the Wii U, the obvious one being what exactly is it and how can it be used to good effect in games. The most obvious example thus far has been in Madden NFL football simulation, using it to call plays so the other player can't see. And of course, you're going to be able to use it to video conference, use it like a remote control. But that's what's got everybody wondering this year is just what types of games is the system going to be able to deliver. And of course, the Wii's appeal was to a very casual audience and Nintendo desperately needs to reach out to the hardcore in the wake of attrition thanks to smartphones and tablets which have largely nibbled away at that casual gaming audience on which the Wii first established success. So who is the Wii U aimed at? It's hard to tell exactly who the Wii U is aimed at. Obviously going to be a very casual and family-friendly audience. They're going to try and get players of all ages as they did with the Wii. But the worry is that the market has been there, done that, and has moved on with mobile, digital, online, free-to-play games that you can get your web browser and Facebook. A lot of these snack food style games, people are getting in different ways from a variety of different sources and oftentimes very much for free. So it's hard to see whether or not the Wii U is going to be able to get loyalists, diehards. Obviously they have key franchises, Mario, Zelda, Donkey Kong, and these are going to do well for them. But again, they've got to show strong third-party support and got to be able to deliver some games that are going to draw traditional gaming audiences who may otherwise be on the PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360. Now, you've mentioned mobile a lot, and everybody's always talking about mobile because it just seems to be exploding as, as a sector. Mm. Is there anything new that you've heard so far? I realize the whole thing doesn't really open until tomorrow, but you've had a little preview of what may be coming. Is there anything new other than just new titles? What's, what's happening in the mobile space? Well, largely in the mobile space, what you're seeing is a lot of activity around free-to-play. Obviously, a lot of downloads in 2011, well over 96% for smartphones were free. So a lot of publishers are switching their model to free-to-play experiences. But when I say that, that doesn't mean that the quality has to sacrifice. So in the past, when you thought about free, you thought about bite-sized, small. What we're seeing in the mobile gaming arena is the move to more blockbuster retail quality productions, a lot better graphics, a lot more complex gaming experiences that may seem very simple on the surface, but often for just as much depth as what you would see from retail products. And of course, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on cross-platform play between handheld platforms, for example, like the PlayStation Vita dedicated gaming handheld and the PlayStation 3 set-top console. So free doesn't sound like a big revenue maker. How does this spin into any money for these companies that are offering these free games? 
Well, that is the big question. Free-to-play has actually been very successful for a number of companies because you have so many players playing that even though conversion rates are low, could be as little as 2 to 3 percent, the publishers can actually make more money in some cases than they would with retail or subscription product. But the issue now is that you have thousands of titles, you have major players flooding into the space, and it's very hard to get discovered and very hard to keep user loyalty. The average user, for example, will only play with six or seven titles on their smartphone at any given time, and it may be 10 days before they actually make a purchase. So if you think about that, you have to hook them very early and have to be very sticky and viral. Otherwise, they've moved on to thousands of other titles. So it is going to be very difficult out there going forward, free or otherwise. Now, I understand that cloud computing is also having an impact on the gaming industry. How so? Well, we're seeing companies like Gaikai and OnLive that are delivering these streaming solutions so even very low-end hardware can have very high-quality gaming experiences and deliver games on demand like Netflix would for digital movies. But the issue with cloud is that it's still very much in its infancy, still have to have a very high-speed broadband connection, and not a lot of companies have embraced it quite yet. You're seeing some high-profile partnerships, but we're still at the tip of the iceberg, yet to be determined just how much of an impact it's going to have on the gaming business. There's going to be new pricing models, maybe able to rent by the hour, may be able to download games, uh, although you'll never have to install them. So there are some very big positives to it, and of course you'll be able, even with very simplistic gaming hardware, to play very complex experiences, but again, yet to be proven just how far off we are from reaching a tipping point there from a business case. Now this uh, exposition usually is a place where people start to get a sense of, okay, what may be the blockbuster for this upcoming holiday? season. Are you seeing or hearing anything that would give you a read on that? Well, Halo 4 looks to be one of the early blockbusters. You're also going to see a new installment in the Tomb Raider franchise, which is much more mature. There's a new Splinter Cell coming. If you're into stealth action, that seems to be quite well received thus far. And of course, you're also going to see titles like Dishonored, Supernatural, Thriller, where you play uh, combative individuals. So there's, there's going to be very interesting things there. And of course, Call of Duty, Black Ops 2. This one's the 10-ton gorilla in the room. So getting very early indication of what's going to be there. But again, most of the big blockbuster titles are going to be in predictable franchise. There's not going to be a lot of new intellectual property out there. As the stakes are raised, publishers are going to be looking to classic franchises, whether it's God of War, Forza Motorsport. They're all going to be looking down, to double down on what's proven to work. And is there any particular company behind all those best sellers that you're predicting? Well, there's a number of different companies, everybody from Sony to Microsoft to Nintendo to Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, Square Enix. You're going to see major players. Bethesda Softworks is going to have some heavy hitters coming. So a lot of different companies in the game biz. What's happening is the bigger getting bigger, and th there's also a lot of activity happening on the small end of the spectrum where you see digital, mobile, and social games. But in the middle, there's not a lot of room for average anymore. So if you're in that space, as uh, the gravity moves towards each end of the spectrum, others are getting crushed. Okay. Well, Scott Steinberg, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks again.